Josette Norris will make her Milrose Day Games debut on January 29th as one of the favorites in the Whoop Women's Wanamaker Mile at the Armory Track Center. Her first race there since she finished third in her heat of the Dr. Sander Invitational Mile as a junior at Georgetown in 2018. The former Tenafly High School star, a two-time high school All-American and New Jersey State Champion in the 1600 meters, and an NCAA All-American at 5,000 meters, now runs for Reebok Boston Track Club and trains most of the year under Coach Chris Fox in Charlottesville, Virginia. In her first year, full year as a pro, she finished eighth in the Olympic trials at 5,000 meters and then spent the rest of her st summer stunning America and the world with a series of sensational mile and 1,500 meters races that saw her rank number eight in the world by World Athletics, the governing body of international track and field, and number six by Track and Field News, the most prestigious track and field publication in the world. She finished the 2021 season as the top ranked 1500 mile runner in the United States of America. She joins us from Flagstaff, Arizona, where she is completing altitude training in preparation for her second full season. Welcome, Josette. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for the kind introduction. It's kind of crazy to even hear it back just after the breakout season I had. It's um, a really cool feeling and it gets me excited for even next year. <laughs> It's a long way since the last time you and I did a video, video together in my backyard in Wyckoff in the summer of 2014 with your friends and rivals, Julia Guerra, Corinne Myers, and Catherine Pagano were there. Um, what's, what's, what's the feeling of coming back to New Jersey and, and, and coming back to the metropolitan area and running in front of uh, uh, a nationally televised crowd, but also your friends and family who can see you live. It's so exciting. Um, I've always been a fan of the Milrose Games and always dreamed about being able to run in the Wanamaker Mile. So to have that opportunity this year is really exciting. And it's only 15 minutes from my hometown. So it's really cool to be able to have my friends and family come out. Everyone's really excited. Um, that I'm going to be part of that race and that they'll get to see me run live on the big stage. So I'm just so grateful and happy to have this opportunity. And it's going to be really fun to be able to come home and um, spend some time at home and race against an incredible field at the Milrose Games. If I told you last January, you'd be ranked number one in the country and in the top 10 in the world, what would you have told me? I probably just would have been in shock. Um, it's kind of crazy how the season played out with the focus really on the 5K early on. And then after the disappointment of the Olympic trials, I changed gears and wanted to have some fun exploring the 1500 some more. And it just opened so many doors for me and the chance to go run in the Diamond League circuit and go to Europe. I had never left the country before. Um, raced at that level, at that high intensity back to back. And it was such a cool experience and opportunity. And I had so much fun out there. I, I remember at the, after the Zurich final, I like didn't want the season to end because um, everything was just clicking so well. I was healthy. I was happy. I was gaining confidence every single race. Um, it was a pretty incredible way to end the season. And I can't wait to use that momentum this year and see what I'm capable of after another year under me of being healthy and being a professional. I'm not allowed to disclose the full field until the story runs on Friday morning, but I can tell everyone that the three women who represented the U.S. in the 1500 at Tokyo are in the Milrose field, including Elle Perrier St. Pierre, the only other American woman to break four minutes last year other than yourself. It'll be your first race of the year and perhaps the most famous indoor meet in America. What are you looking to get out of the race? And what are you, what are you most looking forward to in that race? I'm just excited um, to have an opportunity to race that field and be back in New York and just see what I'm capable of coming off of a breakout season. The fall has been, we've been pretty slow going, um, building back up and just making sure that I'm healthy and feeling good after such a long extended season into 
um, late September. So we've been taking things slowly, but it's been exciting to see how quickly um, the fitness is coming back. And indoors is all about just getting strong for the outdoor season. And it's really special to have an opportunity of a world-class field in the indoor season um, to be able to test it so early in the year. So I think it's just going to be a really exciting and fun race for everybody, especially the fans after not being able to have the Milrose games last year. So there's a lot of excitement around the Milrose games. And I just feel really grateful to be a part of that and see what I'm capable of in an early season race. Do you know what the rest of your winter looks like yet in terms of racing? So the Milrose games mile, and then I, I am hoping to be able to um, stay stay home that week and race at Ocean Breeze the next week at the New Balance Grand Prix, but um, nothing's official yet. And then just the focus would be just run um, USA's out in Spokane, Washington in either the mile or the 3K. So, um, and hopefully Worlds. I'm going to go for my shot at making a world team in the indoor season if everything's oh. feeling feeling well. So. <laughs> and and where are indoor worlds? I didn't even think about that. It's in I, Serbia. Oh, okay. So your passport, you know your passport's in order because uh, you, you got it tested last year. Yeah, I got it signed for the first time a couple months ago. <laughs> so that was really exciting. I was very giddy getting it signed in Iceland after the pre-Fontaine race because we flew from Eugene, Oregon to uh, Lausanne, Switzerland, and we had to fly through Iceland all the way across. Um, but I, yeah, I was pretty excited when I got that first uh, stamp in my passport. Let's go back to the beginning. When did you first start running? Um, I was always running around in elementary school and playing every single sport that I could do, whether it was basketball, soccer, softball. Um, I was always wanting to be outside and playing at recess and playing after school. And um, I joined my church team, OLMC, Our Lady of Mount Carmel in Tenafly, New Jersey um, in elementary school. And I did that while also playing soccer and basketball and softball. And um, I found a lot of success early on in running. And um, it was something that I found myself really thriving at and I continued to run and play a lot of sports um, all throughout middle school and high school and I really saw that breakout in running um, at the high school level when I did transition full-time to running um, and that's when I really had that breakout year my junior year of high school but um, I always saw and loved running from an early age um, and then when it really became a priority I was able to see such these breakthroughs that I hadn't seen before um, at that level. And it really, that was the game changer in opening the door to be able to run in college and um, just get that started for me. So it started young and um, slowly developed as the years went on. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm gonna, I wanna get into that a little more. I did a little research and they found your first high school race was in a dual meet at Darlington Park on September 11th, 2010. And you ran, won a dual meet against Mawa, and you ran 21-23 for the 5K course at Darlington. Do you remember the race? I do not remember <laughs> okay. the race. <laughs> but as you said, your first two years in high school, you had a lot of success. You were all North Jersey and cross country twice. You won a league title. You made the state meet of champions. You did pretty well in the spring. But what happened in the spring of your sophomore year and summer and why you made the decision to become a full-time runner? Yeah, I remember being um, frustrated after my sophomore year season that I didn't make such big improvements compared to my freshman year. Um, I pretty much matched my mile time, I think. And I think I just left the season being like really frustrated about why I wasn't seeing as much improvement as I thought I should. And um, it took having some conversation with my coaches and realizing that really when after cross country season, I really didn't touch my running shoes. I threw them away and didn't run at all um, for the entire um, indoor season and just focused on basketball and making it as far as I could with my state team um, for Tenafly. And basketball was the focus. And then coming back out to the spring season, I just didn't have any foundation back under me to really find 
success in um, running at the level I wanted to be. So that fall in um, cross that summer going into the cross country season, I really made it a priority to do summer training. I hadn't really done any summer training going into um, freshman year and sophomore year. And I just made running a bigger priority in my life. And that was a really key thing into just getting that strength and foundation under me. And after having such a great cross country season, um, it really was an easy, it was a hard decision, but I knew it was the right decision to go into the indoor track season and really keep running to be able to be at the level I wanted to be at um, for the outdoor season. And that's when I had a huge transformation. I remember I ran 509 as a sophomore in high school. And I was like, my goal was to break five minutes in the mile. And when I did my first indoor season, um, my junior year, I ran five minutes in the mile right away. And I was like, that was my whole goal for high school. That's crazy. <laughs> and um, it was just a domino effect. Um, I just kept getting stronger and faster. And it went from 508 to five minutes to 448 to 445 to 441 to win the state title my junior year at the state meet of champions in New Jersey. And it was an incredible year um, and season. And it was really validating after seeing that success that I did make the right move because it was really hard to leave my best friends and my basketball team. And I loved basketball. It was really hard for me. Um, to leave, but I knew it was the right move. And I ended that season actually getting second at nationals um, that year too, in the outdoor season, um, which was just one of the highlights of the year. Um, and I was able to build on that for my senior year too. And that's what really sparked a lot of interest with the colleges and um, opened a lot more doors for me. And of course, let's let's turn to that senior year. You had a great cross country season. You had a great, you won the group meet. You had a great race in the meet of champs. You got a very close second. And then you had the first real injury of your career. How did that, how did you handle that? And, and how were you able to overcome that at the time? That was, that was a really hard injury. I actually, I ruptured my planner at the um, cross country uh, state meet of championships in the race at mile two. And in the moment, I had no idea what just happened. I just was in an insane amount of pain. And even after the race, um, I didn't say anything because I really just didn't know what had happened. But I remember I was just so disappointed because I really felt like that was my chance to win a cross country title. But um, it took me out for the indoor season. And that was okay because I just knew I really wanted to focus on building back up for that outdoor season. And I had to learn to cross train and do all the little things um, that it takes to get back after being injured. And it did take me a while. I did have to learn how to cross train to like watch out for myself without just everything coming so easy with running. So um, it took a lot of building back um, and I was able to find a rhythm by the end of the outdoor season, but it definitely took a little bit of time um, and just a lot of determination. And I think there was a sense of ease in the sense that I knew where I was going to school and things like that. Um, there wasn't a lot of pressure to force anything because in the moment it was like, okay, well, college is coming up and that's definitely the most important thing. So I don't want to force anything right now, but if my body can get back for where it needs to be um, for the outdoor season. I'm going to give it my all. And I did. I worked really hard um, the beginning of that spring season and um, was able to come away with some success in the outdoor season. Mm -hmm. um, not not the records of the times that I wanted to run in the mile after that breakout junior year, but um, it all it all worked out OK. <laughs> and I remember at the state meeting champions when you when you'd finished second in the 1600. You were so annoyed that you came back and you ran the 3200, which is almost never done in that meet. You don't, you know, it's too, it's too tough for me to run a quality double. And you said, I, I'm not ending on this note. And you ran a very good 3200 and you made all American again at nationals in the mile. So yep. you, pick, you go to North Carolina and you love the place, but the next few years aren't easy. Talk about that. I was obsessed with UNC in 
high school actually. And that was the first um, college I had really ever seen. Me and my, one of my best friends went on a road trip down to Myrtle Beach and I was going to go watch her play um, so a softball tournament. And her mom was like, hey guys, you want to go stop at UNC Chapel Hill? And we were like screaming in the back of the car, like, yes, yes. <laughs> and this was going into my junior year. So before I had this breakout where even the possibility of going to UNC um, was a thing. And I remember falling in love with the school and there was like a little bit of probably like an obsession after that. And then when the opportunity arose where there was a chance to then be able to go run there and get a scholarship to go there, um, I explored other schools too. And it was a really tough decision, but my heart kept and my gut kept saying like, no, UNC is the place. Like it's too good of an opportunity to pass up. And it was so far out of reach sophomore year. And then a year later, um, they're coming and coming to my house asking if I want to go run there. It was just a crazy full circle moment and um, love the school, love my teammates and um, the great balance of like academics and running. But um, and we won ACC's my freshman year. I was part of that squad um, who and I had a nice, nice year, my sophomore year. Um, I was like one of the first two out of nationals in the 5k um, in the spring season. I just, um, I felt like something was missing. And if I wanted to be at the level that I thought I could be at, I felt like I needed to make a change or I was going to regret it. So I think I just kind of followed my heart and my gut in that decision. And of course that was another really hard transition when I did end up transferring. Um, and I felt like I was kind of a freshman all over again making those changes and um adjusting to a new lifestyle and being in college um but um luckily i found success finally in my fifth year at georgetown and um that was really it took me that long to have a real breakout season in college that i thought i was capable of from my freshman year um i just couldn't find a rhythm or a system that was really I was able to thrive in until then. And once I really found that rhythm and consistency, I was able to showcase my, uh, my fitness and what, and regain that confidence back to really have success. And yeah, you, you make it easy because now I can skip over a question. And as you say, the college story has a happy ending. You take fourth in the 5,000 at Eugene, you're in the race all the way. You followed up with a solid performance at the USATF Nationals that year. How did the pro thing happen? And how did you end up with Reebok Boston and one of the top agents in the world in race lane? Yeah, so um, I got to run at my first NCAs and ended up finishing fourth and first team All-American, which was something I was so proud of because I hadn't been to that before. And to be able to come away from that race with a really successful performance at my first NCAs was something I was really proud of. And I felt pretty strong um, ending the season that way and felt like there was a lot more left in me. And um, that race actually caught um, some agents' attention. And I got to meet Ray at um, NCAs. Um, and he's also my fiance, Robbie's agent. So that was a nice little um, connection to start with someone that I've seen treat Robbie so well. And um, I felt comfortable um, with Ray in that moment too. But um, yeah, the spring season started up kind of late because I didn't have cross country the fall of my fifth year and I was recovering from an injury. So I had a late start to that indoor outdoor season. So I felt like I really had a lot more running left in me. So um, me and coach Julie Cully and coach Baker made up a plan to keep continuing to run and I was able to go um, run at a couple races um, at Princeton and then get um, got my qualifier for USA's out in California. Um, so I was able to like I ran 413. Oh, no, I ran 410 at um, a Princeton race against um, a big field of pros and college runners and ended up finishing second um, in that race. And then followed that up with a 5K in Azusa. Um, where I mm -hmm. ran 1529 against um, a, a huge pro right. field. And that was what qualified me for USA's that year at Drake. And I finished 12th at USA's. And at that point at USA's, I was definitely pretty tired, but um, I was able to 
really bring down my personal best and show that I could run with the professionals. And um, I got to meet with some pro groups. And that's where I met Coach Fox and um, Coach Smith at USA's and talked to them. And I felt like that was the best fit for um, the opportunities that were presented to me. Um, and I signed with Reebok Boston Track Club that September. And then I moved down to Charlottesville, Virginia, because that's where the Reebok group trains. And um, it's crazy. It really feels like this past year was my first year as a professional, even though it was my second because of the pandemic year. Um, but I'm really glad it clicked in this year. And um, yeah, I'm excited to keep training under Coach Fox and Coach Smith and see what um, is possible this next year. You turn pro, as you just said, you're healthy at last. You're in very good shape. COVID hits. But in a way, for your running career, it wasn't a bad thing that that COVID hit because you were able to get adjusted to the new training and you're able to maintain your fitness. And now you come into 2021. It's become an Olympic year, which it wasn't supposed to be. You run well early in the year in some indoor races. You cash your first paychecks. You qualify for the Olympic trials with a great race under not great conditions in Austin, Texas, in the 5K. You run even better in the 5K in California, which gives you an Olympic qualifier and actually puts you on the radar for an Olympic berth. You win your heat of the trials. You're looking really good to have a shot to win, to, to qualify to go to Tokyo. And then 100 degrees hits in the finals, it hits everybody, but you're the sort of the newcomer. You're in there for 4,000 meters and then you finish eighth. No Olympics. That dream for the year is over. How did you handle that? And how did you then make the transition to becoming one of the top 10, 1500 milers in the world over the next three months? <laughs> Um, yeah, the, the disappointment of the trials, that was really hard. Um, it just went in that last like 1200 meters when things were really uncomfortable and hurting. Um, I think, I think in the last hundred meters, I got passed by four or five people. I'm not even sure it's kind of like a blur, but, um, that was hard. And I left with a lot of questions of like, what, what just happened in that moment and, um, feeling, feeling a bit like a failure. Um, uh, in that first few days, just of like what went wrong and just wanting to like replay that race over and over again. But um, after a couple of days of kind of being in the fields, I kind of just like, I had to move on. Um, <laughs> so I think I just kind of put my head down for another month and kept training. And I knew I was in really good shape and I really didn't want that moment to define the year. I was having such a breakout every race was going so smoothly. And of course, the one bad race I had was the most important race of the season, which was really sad. Um, but I knew also that there was still a lot left in me and what we were training for. So I was almost like anxious to keep racing and show like that, that performance wasn't me and there's a lot more in there. So um, I was just kind of biding my time to have another opportunity to race. And um, a month went by and I put together some incredible workouts um, with the help of Robbie um, pacing me in a lot of them. And um, we went out to California for a 10 day trip. And um, there was talk about Jess Hall going for um, sub four in the 1500. And it sounded like a really incredible opportunity that I didn't really want to pass up because I was having a lot of success um, in the US circuit in the 1500. And I wanted to really see what I was capable of in a race where I had really hard competition and um, was gonna get pushed with a pacer and some really incredible conditions out in California. So um, Fox um, said, Coach Fox said I could go out there and do that 1500 and the 5K. And the goal going out there was just to get my standards for next year um, because the it reopened up right after the trials to go get um, the world standards for 2022. And um, we thought I was in probably like 359, 402 shape. And it just depended on the race, um, what it was going to be capable of. And I was able to come away with a win and run um, under four and run 359. And that was like such a 
incredible feeling. I remember I ran through the line so far. I almost wish it was a mile because I was so <laughs> amped up and like ran all the way to the fence through the line. Like I had so much momentum and excitement. Um, I'd never felt that good in a race in my entire life. It was um, an incredible feeling and really validating after that's my first race back from the Olympic trials 5k. And um, I know it shocked a lot of people and no one really saw that coming. But I think we did early on, I just never had a 1500 to showcase it. And I remember the week before the trials, um, I went out to Boston, and it was freezing like mm -hmm. 35 degrees. And I ran 406 for the win, but the conditions were so brutal. Um, and I remember seeing everyone out in Portland, and they all raced. Um, the Portland twilight and had incredible 1500s. And I remember texting um, my college coach, Julie, actually and saying, I wish I was in that race um, to really show what I was capable of. And she was like, you'll have your time, you'll have your time. And um, it was really cool then to have that opportunity out in California. And then I remember I stayed up till probably like 5 a.m. because I was so excited and I couldn't sleep. And I had to regroup though, because I had a 5K coming up um, in six days and um went out to that 5k at sound running and um incredible field again it was um coco abby cooper emily infeld um and a pack of us and i ended up leading pretty much 4k of that race um before coco took over and um battled with her until the last hundred and was able to come away with another win and run 1451 again um like i had out in california a couple months prior so that was really validating to even run 1451 but in a completely different way than i had um a couple months ago where this one i was like really in command and in control compared to the other one where i was really hanging on um and just trying to like bide my time and like hang on to the pack um so that was a great weekend out in california and that's what ultimately um opened the door to the diamond league circuit in the 1500 and i was so excited when that happened, because that meant my season was going to be extended. And um, the chance to even go to Europe was in uh, in the cards because I got confirmed for um, the Prefontaine 1500 Diamond League and then the Lausanne Diamond League. Um, so it was really an incredible way to turn around um, the trials 5k and really put my attention into a different event, which was really fun. And the 1500 is a really fun event for me and um my body seems to respond really well um just in that event it doesn't take as much out of me as the 5k so i felt capable and energized enough to like do those back-to-back -back high intensity performances out in the diamond league circuit in the 1500 uh i i i'm i'm thinking i'm listening to this looking at my questions and saying well i don't have to ask this question i don't have to ask this question which is great but i think it's one of the things I would ask that was there on my original question, where were you and how did you find out you got into pre? Well, the week um, before uh, Prefontaine, um, I knew that the 1500 was a Diamond League event or the week before the California races. I knew the 1500 was a Diamond League event and that the 3K wasn't going to be one. So I remember wanting to run the Prefontaine meet, but I really wanted to run the 1500, not the 3K and um, or the two mile. And I knew I needed to put up a really big performance to show that I was capable of being in that field. And um, af right after the race, I remember um, just being um, pretty like excited because I knew that there was a really big possibility that now that could open the door for me. So I kind of had a feeling that um, that door was going to be opened right after that race. And then I think I found out maybe the next day um, or a day or two later that um, they wanted me out there. So that was just really exciting, even going into the 5k a couple days later, but it all happened pretty quickly. Um, but I had it on my radar going into that California race. So um, it was a cool goal to be able to accomplish. <laughs> well, it's one thing to have a door open. It's the other thing to, once it's open, to barge right in and be part of the party. I mean, you, <laughs> you have, you finish third in Prefontaine. You run a phenomenal race in Prefontaine. You go to Lausanne. It's only a few days later. It's your first, as you said, it's a long flight. It's your first European flight, not just your first European race. You run well there. 
you run maybe maybe the of the four races you ran in the Diamond League, the Brussels race didn't end quite the way you wanted it to, but that was different. And then you qualify for the final at Zurich. And I we couldn't get permission to show it. But with 200 meters to go, Jose Norris is in that race to win it. What's, what's going through your mind as you're coming with 200 meters to go and you're right there? That was in the moment. I, I remember saying to myself, oh, my God, like I, I'm in this. And weirdly enough, the race played out to as best as I kind of like imagined it going into it, like best case scenario. Um, it happened the way I wanted it to. And for a little bit of background context, like as in the first few diamond leagues, I think I definitely was like asserting myself up in the front and maybe swaying and wasting energy and just trying to find my rhythm in that international field. And I knew going into the final, I needed to relax. I needed to be calm, be patient and not force my way up to the front. So I could really thrive in the last 400 meters because I felt like I wasn't able to really showcase my last 400 and the previous diamond leagues because I felt like I was wasting a little too much energy early on. So going into that final, um, we really talked about like staying patient, staying calm. And with 300 to go, I am going to be full on sprinting for 300 meters. And the race played out where it was a slow race. And we actually, we ended up going through the 800 and 210 which is um, a pretty tactical for a diamond league. Um, and everyone was still in the field. And right before the last 400 on the straightaway with 500 to go, I made a big move on the straightaway to maybe pass probably five people to put myself right behind um, Hassan and with 400 to go. And I remember I was like fighting a little bit on the outside in lane two. And I knew, I knew with 300 to go, this race was going to take off. And um, Faith and Hassan start, going and I was the I went with them and I was even with them with probably 150 to go and they of course had one more gear in them that I didn't but I was so proud that I was able to really go when it mattered and I remember watching the race back and they were like the American is the only one going with Faith and Hassan and um, that was just really it was so fun watching it back and being like I'm not American um but just like seeing it because um I in the moment it happened so quick and I don't even realize like how fearless of a race that was. And looking back, like I ran really fearlessly and brave. And I think that's what got me my third place finish. I was able to hold on for third and run four flat. Um, again, like I ran four flat at, um, uh, Prefontaine as well. And to do that in the diamond league final, the most prestigious race of the year after the Olympics, was such an incredible feeling to finish behind the Olympic champion and world record holder in the mile. And then Josette Norris, like what an incredible end of the season. And um, I was just so, I was really proud of how um, everything came together. And I really just felt like I took advantage of every opportunity I was given and the cards that I was drawn. Like I, I didn't make the Olympic team. And of course I would have done anything to be at the Olympics and taking away everything else that I did, but I, ex I was able to extend my season and find success in a different event instead of just staying in the U S circuit and maybe just ending my season midsummer. Um, I got the chance to go to Europe and race internationally and get all this experience, um, that I probably would have never gotten, um, hadn't I like gone out and put myself back out there after the Olympic trial. So, it was just um, a really proud moment. And uh, my fiance, Ravi, was out there with me in Europe the whole time. And it was such a fun time uh, exploring Europe and racing at the highest level and finding success um, while doing it. And now I can take that with me. And it's, um, it's really exciting. And it was so special. And of course, after the race, going to Lake Como to relax a little bit and, and, and really enjoy yourself. Um, and put a great end to your 21, 20, 2021 season, which was also full of races. It's probably more races than you ran since you were a high school junior for the entire year. And of course, now 2022 is shaping up. It's a huge year, not only because you're going to be shooting 
for your first U.S. title. You're going to try. Now I found out today for the indoor worlds, obviously the world championship for the first time in the United States in Eugene. You'd like to make that team. But you're also planning a wedding to Robbie, who is Robbie Andrews, a nice Jersey boy for a nice <laughs> Jersey girl. Um, um, how will you be able to manage all that? How are you going to be able to juggle all that this year? Yeah, I think every um, season, like you go into it with, of course, my biggest focus is outdoors and making it to the world stage um, in Eugene, the first time ever in the US, the world championships outdoor is my primary focus this year. And um, my training is going to be built around that. And I think it's just even this fall, we've taken things um, pretty conservatively just to make sure that I am recovered from such a long breakout season. And I didn't even realize how many races I ran um, looking back and like seeing the ranking and every single race broken down all the way from um, the early season in like February and March. And I did race a lot and it was really exciting. And I remember even in Europe, um, Coach Fox being a little nervous because we hadn't planned on the season being that long um, and that high intensity. So we were just making sure everything um, was going well. And I was pleasantly surprised with how my body was responding that late in the season. And um, the approach is going to be the same, like keep getting stronger. And that's gonna, what's going to make me faster. And um, I'm excited to run the 15 and the 5K. And this is my first time doing such an of intense indoor season. Um, like all the races on the schedule are pretty high intensity. Um, but that's exciting because now I've earned that opportunity after that breakout season I just had to be put in these races. And that's what every professional wants to be able to be a part of. Um, so it's a really cool opportunity to now um, be invited to these races um, for the indoor season. And I really hope to make an indoors team just to give me that experience going into outdoors. Um, but outdoors is definitely the focus. And we're making sure the wedding planning is going to be fun and enjoyable and um not too much pressure off either of our backs but we make a really good team and um together i think we know how to manage our time and our energy um and what's the focus so it'll be a really fun way at the end of 2022 um to be able to celebrate um our partnership and um, we're really excited for that too so a lot of exciting things are happening in 2022 and it's just a matter of staying consistent and healthy and um just enjoying it and that's the biggest thing i had so much fun racing and racing at the highest level and um i think that really showcased in my performances and um i gotta make sure i'm not just trying to like replicate everything i just did last year because every year is different um even coming back to flagstaff arizona i came here last year um and I've caught myself a couple of times, like comparing everything I did. And I have to remember um, every season, every month, it's going to be a little different. I'm a different athlete than I was a year ago. Um, I had been running for longer. So there's a lot of things and perspectives that you have to take and um, a lot of trust in yourself and your coach and your partner. And um, I think I have a really good like head on my shoulders and a team around me to make sure that I'm set up for success. and. So there's a lot of, it's going to be exciting. <laughs> One final question. And thank you so much for this time. And, and look, you, in my mind, you're a better runner, you're a better athlete, but you're the same person I met more than 10 years ago. And, and the same person I've conversed with on a number of occasions. And that to me, I'm so excited for you and for that. And I'm not surprised in the least what what is wonderful is you haven't changed a bit so with that in mind here's the final question there are a lot of boys and girls in bergen and Passaic counties who are running track and field and cross country at the same place as you were not that long ago what advice would you give to them wow um my biggest advice would be to really um like believe in yourself and your potential. I think any time that I've had a setback or something hasn't gone my way, I've always never stopped believing that I could be successful um, and believe in myself and my running. And I think I held on to that for so long and it took me 
it took me till my fifth year of college to break my high school mile PR. And I would have never imagined that to happen in my journey, but I never stopped like believing in my heart that I was capable of doing great things in this sport. And it was such a passion of mine that I didn't want it to end and I wasn't going to allow it to end um, without having my shot as being a professional runner. So that's been huge. Like I've always been someone who's believed in my potential and what I could be capable of if I had the chance to showcase it. And um, I would give that advice to the high school runners that are wanting and waiting to have that breakout moment or that chance to find success or who maybe is struggling or who is having success and wants to continue that. Um, I think having some that self-belief and um, like self-respect of your goals and what you want is huge. And if you can hold on to that, you're going to, you are going to find success. And um, it's, it's really important. Josette Norris, thank you so much for joining us today. Best of luck at Mill Roads on January 29th. The race is going to be on in the, I found out they moved the window. The NBC window is now 2.30 to 4.30, not 4 to 6. So the race is going to be a little bit earlier. It's going to oh, be on no. Channel 4 up there in New York area. Um, great success for this year and beyond, both in the track and, of course, in life with you and Robbie. This is Paul Schwartz from Varsity Aces signing off and wishing everyone a happy and a healthy new year. And let's go, Josette.